at the Institute of uh, Air Sciences uh, in, in Hebrew University. Uh, Haim in, is, is a faculty member, uh, um, is a faculty member uh, one and a half years. Um, and he, he completed his PhD in Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Washington with a top scholar award and with Golden Mayor Fellowships. As their research interests are stratosphere, troposphere interactions, a climate variability on, on interseasonal to uh, decadal time scales, and the general uh, circulations of the atmosphere. This. Right. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you for coming. I know my research is, is a little bit different than what most of you study or probably all of you study. And I also tend to, spot, tend to speak too quickly in English. So if at some point I start speaking way too fast, uh, please let me know and I'll, I'll try to slow down. So today I'll be discussing um, coupling between tropical convection and variability in the polar stratosphere. Um, and my collaborators on this work, um, there's too many to list, so I'll, I'll just tell them to you. Uh, Dennis Hartman, Amy Butler, Maggie Horitz, Luke Bowman, Stephen Feldstein, Su Kyung Lee, Chang Hong Yu, and a couple others as well. And what you're watching here uh, in this animation is, a, is, is an example of extreme variability in the polar stratosphere. Uh, so this is about 30 kilometers above the Earth's surface, um, over just a, a view over the pole, looking down at the North Pole, looking down at the atmosphere. And what you see here are large temperature anomalies that develop over the span of a couple of weeks. You have over the span of a couple of weeks uh, a greater than 50 Kelvin change in temperature. And this is perhaps the most uh, striking example of polar stratospheric variability. And I'll be discussing uh, what some of the forcing mechanisms for, for, for some of this variability. And then once we have large anomalies in the polar stratosphere, how that then impacts uh, surface climate. Um, so just some motivation, uh, why do we care about the stratosphere? So much research and investment goes into predictions of seasonal variability. Um, so every fall in the, in, the, in the United States, the Climate Prediction Center uh, issues forecasts uh, for the upcoming winter. Uh, here's a forecast for, of temperature and precipitation uh, for a couple winters ago. Um, and there's a, it was forecasted to be warmer in the southern US, cooler up here in the Great Plains and Northwest and drier in the, in the southern US and wetter uh, generally further north. And these kinds of forecasts are useful uh, for many, they have, have many uses for, um, elect for electricity uh, demand and generation, for transportation, for air agriculture. There are many uses for these kinds of forecasts. And, and if we can produce better forecasts, that would be of great value for society. Um, and so any additional source of predictability that can lead to uh, more accurate and more reliable forecasts would be of great use. And just to give you an idea, uh, so this is the same temperature uh, forecast, temperature prediction. This was produced in October uh, before the, this particular winter. And this is what actually happened that winter. And if you, if you compare these two, you see that the, this forecast was basically worthless. There was, there was essentially no added value uh, to this forecast um, as compared to what would actually occur. And in particular, this, this winter especially, um, this, the polar stratosphere had a large impact on the, on, on the temperature that was experienced in the U.S. this winter, and therefore it, it, it would be of great value if you can understand the polar stratospheric variability in more detail, and hopefully eventually use it to improve our, our projections of seasonal variability and winter outlooks uh, going forward. So just for, for those of you who have never heard of the stratosphere, um, we think about the ocean uh, mostly. So this is the atmosphere, this is a vertical cross-section uh, of the atmosphere. The, the bottom layer of the atmosphere is called the troposphere. That's where most of the storms, I mean, all the storms we experience um, reside uh, in, the, in, the, in the bottom 10 kilometers of the atmosphere, uh, both extratropical type storms and also uh, deep, deep convection in the tropics. Um, they're basically topped at, near the tropopause uh, about 10 kilometers above the surface. And this is where planes fly. I mean, basically planes fly just above and near the tropopause, the layer between the troposphere and the stratosphere. So what happens above the, tr the tr troposphere is the stratosphere. In the stratosphere, temperature increases with height. So in the troposphere, temperature decreases with height. In the stratosphere, it increases with height. Uh, this is where the ozone layer is. Uh, and because of the ozone layer, that's why temperatures increase with height in the stratosphere. In general, the stratosphere is fairly um, boring on, on, as compared to the troposphere. In other words, storms and 
the things that we experience on a daily basis are in the, in the troposphere only and they decay in the stratosphere. However, there is large, a large amount of variability in the stratosphere. And in particular, the variability that does occur in the stratosphere in this re region of, up here um, tends to be on longer time scales. It tends to persist for weeks or even months at a time. And therefore, it, it can be uh, used um, to help project uh, what's going on, what will, what will occur at the surface uh, later on. So this is just this is a, a cross section. Uh, just to give you a sense of, of, of the stratosphere and troposphere again. This is a cross section of zonally average zonal wind uh, in the northern hemisphere in winter time. Here are from the equator to the north pole, from the surface all the way up to the top of the stratosphere. So in the troposphere, we have a very strong jet in the near 30 degrees north, uh, which is a subtropical jet. Uh, which, um, if, if you've taken courses in meteorology, uh, you, you may have been exposed to this. Uh, what, above it, though, we have this second region with very strong winds in the climatology. Uh, we have regions up in, in the polar stratosphere, we have very strong winds, typically um, approaching 50 meter per second in the, in the uppermost stratosphere. And, but this, these winds here are highly variable uh, from, one, from one month to the next and from one winter to the next. And to give you a sense of where the variability is in the atmosphere, this is again the same projection, greater to the North Pole, from the surface all the way uh, to the uh, top of the stratosphere. This is a standard deviation of zonal wind, uh, zonally average zonal wind on monthly time scales uh, using the same, over the same time period. And the troposphere, if, if you look at on monthly time scales, the troposphere is pretty boring. Not, not, the troposphere doesn't change all that much from one month to the next in winter time. However, the stratosphere has experienced quite large changes uh, from, from one, one month to the next. Uh, and in particular, we have I mean, order, order of magnitude more variability in the stratosphere as compared to the troposphere. And what I'll be discussing in this talk is this region over here. In this region in the polar stratosphere, uh, this large variability here. And this large variability in the polar stratosphere uh, can in impact what goes on near the surface and in turn is actually impacted by conditions in the troposphere. In particular, I'll be discussing how variability in the tropics um, can then can lead to variability in the polar stratosphere in this region up here. Just to show this downward propagation, how the polar stratosphere, temperatures in the polar stratosphere impact the surface climate. Uh, here I'm showing just a, 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 it's a plot that may be familiar, that's probably not familiar to any of you, but it is commonly used uh, for people who think about the stratosphere. It shows um, the impact of polar stratosphere, polar stratospheric variability, um, the downward impact of it. So if we take 18 week vortex events, uh, that, have been, that have been observed uh, in the, uh, over the satellite era. We then take, take these weak, weak vortex events, composite them, and we, look, look, and we analyze the downward impact um, associated with these 18 events. So we start, um, here, this is day zero, this is when the event is, is actually occurring. And then uh, for two months after, actually up to three months after the event occurs in the, in the polar stratosphere. So we start with a large impact in the polar stratosphere. What this means is a, this, this red here indicates a weakening of the vortex, uh, weakening of the winds, uh, warmer temperatures in the polar stratosphere. And then the impact propagates downwards uh, very quickly in, in, the, in the stratosphere, and then into the, into the troposphere as well, down, in, down all the way to the surface. And what the impact in the surface, I'll, I'll discuss it on the next slide, um, it leads to a, a, a change in the storm tracks in the troposphere. In other words, the storm tracks and in the troposphere shift the, their location. They shift poleward or equatorward depending on whether the vortex is slightly stronger or slightly weaker. So this is a schematic of some of these impacts. Uh, so this is for a colder uh, polar stratosphere and for a less cold polar stratosphere, a warmer polar stratosphere. So we, we a, we, if we have a colder polar stratosphere, the winds in this region here are stronger. Uh, here the winds are weaker. Uh, and when we have a Polar, polar stratosphere, stronger winds, the storm track is shifted northward, uh, and we have southern Europe and also Israel is drier than usual, and also, and also a little bit warmer. Uh, when we have a less cold stratosphere, the storm tracks in the North Atlantic are shifted equatorward. Uh, our weather is generally uh, moisture. We get more, more, more weather systems uh, here in Israel. Uh, northern Europe is drier. And there are also impacts in the United States as well, um, associated with changes in the stratospheric polar vortex. So much research um, and investment has gone into um, understanding these, these, these downward impacts. And, and in particular, we, what my research is, is mainly focused on is understanding uh, what kind of drivers lead 
uh, to a less cold stratosphere or a colder stratosphere, and how far in advance can we predict uh, the strength of, of the polar vortex and the temperatures over the pole. So th th this, this is another movie, uh, similar to the one I showed on my first slide, of, a extreme, of an example of extreme variability uh, in the polar stratosphere. Again, we're looking down at the North Pole here. And this is a metric of, uh, these blue colors here indicate a, a relatively strong vortex, relatively fast winds. And the, blue, the, the red shadings indicate a weaker vortex, or in this case, a no vortex, if, there's no, if, if there is no gradient at, at all. Uh, so we start, uh, in, in this movie, we start with a relatively strong vortex indicated by the blue. And then after a while, a wave one, a wave number one, a zonal wave number one pattern develops over the pole, uh, which is, you see here. And then after this wave number one pattern develops, the entire pole becomes red or orange, and the vortex is totally uh, destroyed. In other words, the, the winds uh, actually become easterly. They go from 15 meter per second westerlies to easterlies uh, or in the span of a couple of weeks, and temperatures will rise by, let's say, 50 Kelvin uh, in a, in a, over, over the course of a couple of weeks. And this is forced by a burst of waves from the troposphere that propagate upwards. And I'll, I'll discuss that in more detail over the course of the talk. So, so far I've been discussing uh, just sort of the, the zonal mean uh, state um, of, the, of the polar stratosphere. Uh, but the reason why we have variability in the stratosphere to begin with is because of variability in the, in the waves that propagate upwards from the troposphere. Um, just to give you, I'll start down here and with this panel, uh, this is the eddy height field, the, the stationary, stationary wave pattern in the northern hemisphere in winter time. Um, and then this, is, this pattern is forced by uh, land-sea uh, contrast. So as you go from the relatively cold continents to the rel relatively warm oceans, that has a, a large impact on the stationary wave pattern. And also as you go, as you go from, <coughs> because of the Rockies and the Himalayas, the, the Himalayas here and the Rockies here, they, they also have a large impact on the, um, on, on the wave pattern in the, in the troposphere. And what, so the net impact is that downstream of the, of the Himalayas, there's a relative trough in the, in the stationary wave pattern. Uh, downstream of the Rockies, there's also a relative trough. And then over Europe, there's a ridge. And also over the Rockies it's, itself, there's, there's a ridge in a climatological stationary wave pattern. And these waves propagate upwards. In other words, once, once, the, once the Rockies or Himalayas or the, the land sea contrast uh, launched, sets up a wave pattern, the wave pattern can propagate vertically into the stratosphere. And in particular, the two wave components that are important uh, for the stratosphere are the first two zonal wave numbers, zonal wave number one and zonal wave number two. Uh, we have one peak and uh, one trough um, as you, at, at, for a given latitude. And here we have two peaks and two troughs for a given latitude. And these waves, for reasons that um, are explained in this paper that I won't get into here, uh, are able to propagate vertically into the stratosphere, whereas uh, higher wave numbers cannot. So just to give you a sense of, of, of what this wave propagation looks like, this is for wave number one. In other words, this, this wave here, if you look at the upward and propagation of this wave is, what, this, is what's shown here. This is, again, from the equator to the North Pole, from the mid troposphere uh, up to the top of the stratosphere. We have this, there's a large source of wave, of wave number one, in the troposphere. It propagates uh, both equatorward and also vertically upward into the stratosphere. And what you see with these dashed contours is the, the convergence of these waves. As these waves converge in the stratosphere, they deposit their momentum and they weaken the vortex. <coughs> they weaken the stratosphere polar vortex. This is the, 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 this is the time mean. Uh, so the, 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 direction of the, the direction of the arrows is proportional or indicates the direction of wave propagation. And the length of the arrow indicates the, the amplitude of the wave. So this is in the time mean, uh, but there's large variability in these waves from one winter to the next and from one um, even week to the next. Uh, and, and this large variability can strongly impact what goes on uh, in the stratosphere. So a long list of tropospheric phenomena uh, have, been lit, have been linked uh, to the strength of, of this polar vortex, to, to these winds and these temperatures in the polar stratosphere. Uh, I'll briefly just mention the first four and then the, the, the crux of my, talks, of my talk is about these last three. Um, so the first one that has been linked uh, to polar stratospheric variability is snow cover over Eurasia. So over Siberia in October, um, when the first storms of winter develop and, and um, dump snow over Siberia, <coughs> depending on whether there are more storms or fewer storms in a, in a particular year, the amount of snow cover over that region is different. 
And that actually, if, if more, more extensive snow cover uh, over Siberia has been shown to lead to a weaker vortex, and subsequently to this whole chain of events, once you weaken the vortex, it prop the influence propagates downwards uh, and, and, and influences the troposphere as well. That's the first one. The second one is North Atlantic sea surface temperatures. Uh, when temperatures in the North Atlantic are anomalously warm or cold, they, that sets up a local at, um, anomaly in, in, in the lowermost troposphere near the surface, uh, which then impacts the entire troposphere. Uh, and the net effect is that, <coughs> excuse me, if, if you have warmer temperatures uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, you lead to a weakened, excuse me, warmer, temperature, warmer temperatures lead to a weakening, um, a warming of the, of the polar stratosphere um, in, in early winter in particular, and to a, a, an anomaly in the troposphere as well. And the third one, which I'll just, just mention briefly, is Arctic sea ice. Arctic sea ice is also um, declining Arctic sea ice. So over the past, especially the past decade, there, there's been a rapid decline in ice cover over the Arctic Ocean. And this, because there's been a, a decrease in, 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 in ice cover, um, the, the local atmosphere um, is much warmer. Over the Arctic Ocean is much warmer. And for reasons that are still not fully understood, uh, once the temp temperatures over the the bottom of the of, over the Arctic, the, the, in the, the bottom layer of the Arctic atmosphere, are warm. Uh, that leads to also anomalies that somehow propagate upwards. And in particular, when you have declining sea ice, uh, you have a much colder polar stratosphere. Uh, you have a, a warmer a, near the surface. There's warming, which is a direct impact. Um, this is actually winter time. So sorry, uh, the, the direct impact is warming in winter time. You have cooling higher up, and you also have less ozone uh, as well. Um, the, the fourth one I'll, I'll mention just briefly before I get to the main part of my talk is North Pacific sea surface temperatures. So temperatures in the North Pacific, especially in, near the Kiroshio extension region off the coast of Japan, um, the temperatures in that region are also associated with variability um, in, in this wave driving that propagates upwards to the stratosphere. Particular colder sea surface temperatures lead to more wave propagation up into the stratosphere whereas warmer sea surface temperatures lead to uh, less wave propagation upwards into, into the stratosphere. And that's what you're seeing here. If you have relatively warm temperatures, you have a relatively cold polar stratosphere, um, which is what's shown in, in this figure here uh, from November through May uh, here in the troposphere and here in the stratosphere, when we have colder temperatures associated with warmer uh, SSTs, sea surface, sea surface temperatures in the Kiroshio extension region. Uh, so. The, the bulk of my talk is now going to, is going to focus on uh, El Nino, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and the Nana Julian Oscillation, and in particular how they uh, influence the stratospheric polar vortex, and what, what is the potential, uh, how far in advance we have a, the potential for predictability. So just some background on tropical uh, variability. Um, so this is a, a this figure shows um, the climatological precipitation in winter time. Um, over here's South America, here's Australia, here's Asia, and we have large amounts of uh, very, large gradients and precipitation. We have lots of rainfall over the maritime continent, this region here, over Australia, over South America. Uh, here's the intertropical convergence zone. We have these large um, gradients in, in, in rainfall. And what matters for, um, for what I'll be talking about today are the, is the variability. Uh, this is a standard deviation of precipitation in wintertime. Um, and what you see in the, in the, in generally in the regions where we have large amounts of precipitation in the climatology, we also have large, large amounts of variability as well. So over the inter intertropical convergence zone, over the maritime continent, um, in this entire region here, we have large variability. And two of the main sources of variability, um, predictable sources of variability, um, are El Nino, uh, Southern Oscillation, and the Madagelian Oscillation. And I'll talk about each, each of these two in, uh, now. First of all, the Madden-Julian oscillation is the dominant mode of variability in the tropical atmosphere on, time on intra-seasonal time scale, so a time scale of a month or two months. This is a dominant mode of variability. And it consists of eastward propagation of convective anomalies, so deep convection systems that propagate slowly eastward in time. So this is a, this is a time here on the, on the y-axis um, going forward, going down. Um, so this is. Uh, I think 20, 20, 2011 to 2012. So this is September 2012 and October 2011. Uh, and this, this is longitude here. So this is from the Indian Ocean uh, into the um, 
Here's the date line here. Here is maritime continent. Here is the date line, and here is the Atlantic Ocean over here. So we, 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 what the Magellanic Oscillation consists of is our convective anomalies that start in the Indian, in the Indian Ocean and slowly propagate eastward in time. And the, the, the periodicity is roughly 30 to 60 days. And these, these anomalies are mainly over the Indian Ocean and the West Pacific, really to the dateline. And then fr from the dateline eastward, um, they don't really exist so strongly. So the MGO, the Amman Julian Oscillation, is associated with uh, anomalies outside of the tropics as well. It's, it's associated with anomalies in the North Pacific and over Europe as well. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll be discussing that uh, in, in this talk. Second phenomenon is El Nino, Southern Oscillation. Uh, so I'm guessing some of you are probably more familiar with this. Um, so there's the two phases of the El Nino, Southern Oscillation, La Nina and El Nino, uh, are marked by temperature. The, 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 from, from, from the atmospheric perspective, the most important uh, feature of the El Nino is, are the sea surface temperatures uh, over the Central and Eastern Pacific. During El Nino, we have warmer sea surface temperatures over the Central and Eastern Pacific. During El Nino, we have colder sea surface temperatures over the Central and Eastern Pacific. And once we have these anomalies in sea surface temperatures, uh, that leads to anomalies in low-level moisture, uh, low-level temperature, uh, and which in turn leads to anomalies in, in convection, um, in deep convection uh, locally in, in the Central uh, Pacific, especially. And once you have anomalies in, in deep convection in the Central Pacific, that leads to anomalies uh, in the North Pacific as well. It leads to a, a wide range of climate impacts, and this is sort of a schematic of the relation of the impacts of La Nina uh, on the on surface climate uh, out I mean, throughout throughout the globe. So this is a region, it, this region here in this in the uh, eastern Central Pacific. That's where we have the colder sea surface temperatures, uh, and we have a wide range of anomalies uh, throughout the globe. Um, including in the United States, um, not so much in Europe, although there are um, some impacts in Europe as, in here as well, but they're relatively weak. The main impacts are sort of on the, on the, on the Pacific, countries bordering the Pacific, um, and also in the tropics more, uh, more specifically. Um, and historically, the, the kind of projection I showed at the very beginning of my talk of projections of rainfall and temperature uh, for a winter season that are, are produced every year by the, in the, in the United States um, are based mainly on this, based mainly on, on the state of La Nina and El Nino. If there's no La Nina or no El Nino, then the, the confidence is very low um, for any sort of seasonal prediction. Uh, uh, prediction. However, um, but, uh, what I'll be dis discussing today is how, if, if, if we can understand the state of the stratosphere, that can then lead to better predictions um, in the troposphere as well. So, now I'm going to actually get to the, the research part of this talk. Um, so first I'll be discussing so what the apparent connection between the MJO uh, and ENSO and the polar vortex. Then I'll discuss um, more generally what kind of regional tropospheric variability uh, leads to anomalies in the stratospheric polar vortex. And then I'll see how uh, that kind of reasoning applies to the case of the MJO and ENSO uh, and their connection to the polar vortex. And I will most likely not talk about this in the lack of time. So the first thing is, is the, um, the apparent connection between the MGO and ENSO and the stratospheric polar vortex. So this just shows you uh, ENSO's impact on the seasonal mean uh, stratospheric polar vortex. This is temperature um, at 10 hectopascal, so about that temperature about 30 kilometers above the Earth's surface, uh, looking down at the North Pole. Here's the North Pole in the center here. Uh, in each of these spots, this is El Nino, La Nina, and then this is, this is the different spots, uh, La Nina minus El Nino. So for El Nino, uh, we have a warming over the pole. Uh, we have a wave number one structure, actually. Um, we have warming, but it's, it's, it's centered off the pole slightly. La Nina, we have a cooling, uh, relatively zonal mean cooling of, of the polar stratosphere. And the difference is exceeds 10 kilometer to 10 Kelvin uh, for this particular phase, uh, this, this particular choice of years. So we have, a weakening, uh, we have a weakening in the vortex for El Nino, a strengthening in the vortex for La Nina, and this, this difference is so this is significant at greater than 95% level. And this is in reanalysis data, so basically observational data. Um, similar differences are apparent as well in models. Um, this is a fairly robust uh, effect. Um, and once, once our, the anomaly in the polar stratosphere develops, it propagates downwards in time. So this is October through March um, from the surface up to above the stratosphere. This is actually the mesosphere already. Uh, so in December and November, December, January, the polar vortex begins to weaken, 
and the, an the anomaly uh, slowly propagates downwards in time. So the red, which is indicated by the red uh, here, the red uh, contours. Uh, and then once the anomaly reaches the, the troposphere in, in February and March, um, it, it projects onto changes in the jet stream location. Uh, it, it leads to a quayward shift of the jet, um, which would, for example, for Israel, would mean more rainfall, uh, more rainfall in general in southern Europe, less in northern Europe. So this is a, a, a um, the, the, the evolution uh, of the stratosphere troposphere coupled system in response to, to El Nino. So now I'll mention what, what's a, what, what, it, what the connection is between uh, stratospheric variability and the Madden-Julian oscillation. So the Madden-Julian oscillation, I remember I mentioned earlier, is this eastward propagation of, of deep convection from the Indian Ocean to, to the Central Pacific. Uh, and, and what a one commonly used metric of defining that MGO is the so-called Wheeler and Hendon index. Uh, MGO phase one is, is when the convection is in the Indian Ocean, seven and eight is when the convection is in the Central Pacific. So as you go from one to seven, you're, the convection is propagating eastward. Uh, so if, if you look um, one to 12 days before stratospheric sun warmings uh, that were observed in the satellite era, uh, we find that one to 12 days before these sudden warmings, uh, there, phase number seven, MGO phase number seven, when convection was in the Central Pacific, uh, occurred um, essentially double. Uh, the, the likelihood of MGO phase seven was, was double uh, as climatological uh, value uh, during the 12 days before a sudden warming. If you look 13 to 24 days before the sudden warming in the satellite era, uh, MGO phases four, six, and seven uh, occurred more frequently than their climatological distribution. And if you look to, uh, if, you look, if you look a month before sudden warmings in the satellite era, MGO phases two and three occurred significantly more uh, than their climatological distribution in, in this. Uh, so there's a, and, and where we see these circles here, that indicates a significant uh, anomaly. And so there, there appears to be a significant connection between the MGO, uh, tropical convection, uh, the location of tropical convection, and the state of the stratosphere up to a month later. So the, the potential for, for predictability extends uh, for more than a month with, with regards to the MJO. And this figure shows the downward propagation of the MGO anomaly. So this is after MGO phase three. So recall, MGO phase three is what led to a warming of the stratosphere uh, a month later. So if you look at a month after MGO phase three, uh, this is what, and then, then you lag. Uh, this is 20 days after MGO, MGO phase three up to 60 days after MGO phase three from the, the, the surface all the way into the top of the stratosphere. So 30 days after, there's a warming of the pole, a weakening of the winds. The influence slowly propagates downwards into, into the lower stratosphere and then down to the surface. And wherever you see these stars, those are significant, uh, significant anomalies. Uh, and so 50 days after MGO phase three, uh, there are significant anomalies uh, at the surface. Um, and which, which and Victor, for example, if, if, if you know there's an MGO phase three occurring, that would tell you that the likelihood of, of, of rainfall in Israel uh, would be increased 50 days later, which, which can give you some sense of uh, predictability um, for climate in Israel and Southern Europe as well. So the key questions are, so uh, how does this happen? What, what's the mechanism uh, for this connection uh, between the MJO uh, and the polar vortex? And also the, what's, the, what's the mechanism behind the connection between El Nino and the stratospheric polar vortex, and, and how do these, uh, and how do these uh, um, tropical uh, anomalies, tropical modes of variability, affect wave driving that propagates upwards uh, into the stratosphere? And secondly, what, what, how, um, how do we have a wave number one structure of the response to El Nino? Um, recall that the, the effect of El Nino on the vortex had a wave number one structure as opposed to a zonally symmetric st structure. So. Um, how does this wave number one structure uh, develop? Um, so I'll first just um, take a step back and, and look at, um, in general, what kind of variability in the trop in a extratropical troposphere uh, leads to um, anomalies in planetary wave driving uh, in the in the waves that can propagate upwards into the polar stratosphere, and then see if that understanding, if those mechanisms, uh, can be applied to the case of the MJO and ENSO. Uh, so what we will do uh, to, to look for, in general, how does variability in the troposphere, trop extratropical troposphere, affect wave driving of the vortex? Um, well, well, first, um, in general, look what kind of variability in the troposphere uh, leads to changes in the state of the vortex. So we define a vortex weakening index. 
as the change in the vortex state over a 10-day period. And we then correlate that with height anomalies uh, in the troposphere uh, at the beginning of that 10-day period. Uh, and we do this both for our reanalysis data and also for our models. And I've actually done this for three models. I'll just show one model here in particular. Uh, and th what this tells you is what kind of variability in the troposphere uh, in the mid here, this is the middle of the troposphere, 500, 500 hectopascals, which is about five kilometers above the surface. Uh, what kind of variability five kilometers above the surface um, is associated with variability in the polar stratosphere uh, over the next 10 days? And what you see, this is for reanalysis data, observational data, and this is for a model, uh, a whole atmospheric community climate model, uh, which is essentially a, a model of the uh, troposphere, stratosphere, and mesosphere. Um, so what you see is that low anomalies in this region here, low, low, here's, here's North America, here's Asia up here. Uh, so low anomalies near Alaska, uh, near uh, in this region here, and in the, Aleutian, in, the, in, the, in the Aleutian region are associated with weakening of the vortex. Um, ridges uh, over Eastern Europe, over Western Russia, Eastern Europe, are also associated with weakening of the vortex over the following 10 day period. And this is for main analysis data, this is for a model, and the patterns are essentially the same. Uh, the, in both data sources, low anomalies over the um, over Alaska and Western Eastern Russia lead to weakening of the vortex, and ridges over Eastern Europe lead to weakening of the vortex. And there's a couple other no anomalies as well, which I'm not going to discuss. Um, but so, so the question is, why do these low anomalies uh, over the North Pacific and over Eastern Europe um, weaken the vortex? What what is the mechanism uh, whereby these two regions appear to be preferred regions uh, for weakening of, of the vortex? So I'll, uh, to, to answer that, I want to take a return to a slide I showed at the beginning of the talk in the introduction. This is the climatological uh, waves that um, exist in, in, in the troposphere uh, in wintertime. Uh, downstream of the Malayas, again, just to, to remind you, we had a, a, a trough in the pattern over the, rock, over the west coast of North America, we have a ridge. Also over Europe, we have a ridge. Downstream of the Rockies, we have a trough as well. So we have this full, um, and, and these anomalies are generated by, by these mountain ranges and also by the, by the contrast between the land and the ocean. Um, so what, what's important for the stratosphere is the wave number one and wave number two patterns associated uh, with, with this full heat field as only these two wave numbers uh, propagate upwards. So what, I'll, what I just did um, is I filtered, um, if you just take this pattern here and you filter out uh, wave three and higher, so wave, wave number three, wave number four and higher, you filter those out, and this is what you get. This is the pattern, the low, the low wave number high field. And what you see is that there's a low anomaly in the north, in the northwest Pacific, and a ridge over Eastern Europe. And so this is the climatological waves that propagate upwards and, and, and weaken the vortex. And what, what we find is that uh, this is and this is the climatology. When you have an anomaly in time that's co-located with the, with these anomalies, these with these with the climatological stationary waves, you can actually reinforce them. In other words, if you have an anomaly in time, a, low, a, a trough in time, that's co-located with this trough here, that constructively interferes with it, uh, in the same way that two waves propagating can constructively or destructively interfere. Uh, if you have a, a, a trough in this region here, a low in this region here, they, they will constructively interfere with this trough and lead to more wave driving of the vortex. In contrast, in the region where we have a, a ridge in the climatology, higher heights in the climatology, a low anomaly in time, that's, that's, a, that's a ridge in this region here, will reinforce, will constructively interfere with this ridge and reinforce it and lead to more wave, and lead to more wave propagation from the troposphere into the stratosphere. And if we then return to uh, this, this correlation, uh, this, this, this map of the correlation, we see that this explanation works very well. Um, in the region here, uh, in the north, excuse me, in the northwest Pacific, uh, where we have low height anomalies in the climatology, uh, that's generally in the same region where we have a ridge here, um, where in this region here, a trough, a, a trough in this region here constructively interferes with the climatological stationary waves, whereas in this region here, a, a ridge constructively interferes with the climatological stationary waves, and therefore both of these kinds of patterns uh, can lead to more wave propagation from the troposphere into the stratosphere. And just to confirm this, um, so what I'm showing here, um, Focusing on the, on the North Pacific um, low, so I, I take months in which, uh, in this region here, in this region here in the North Pacific where we have a low, uh, I, I take months with that that were, that were 
that feature an anomalously strong low uh, in, the, in the Pacific, and then it take months to have an anomalous ridge, an anomalous high in the North Pacific. I think the difference between these two months, um, showing here the wave propagation, this is zonal wave number one, uh, from the troposphere down, down here into the stratosphere up here, from the equator to the pole. Uh, so when we have an anomalously strong um, trough in the North Pacific, we have enhancement uh, in, wave, in wave number one, uh, waves in the troposphere. And again, the direction of the arrows indicate the direction of wave propagation. The, the length of the arrow indicates the magnitude. So we have enhanced wave propagation from the troposphere upwards uh, into the stratosphere. And these dashed contours here indicate wave convergence, waves that are breaking in this region here and weakening the flow and leading to a weakening of the vortex. So this is, this is the actual wave propagation itself. This is, if you look at the height field, if you just take the height field and do a, a, a take the, the, basically the wave number one uh, Fourier mode, um, this is showing the wave number one Fourier mode, again, for this difference between months with an anomalous low in the North Pacific versus months with, a, with an anomalous high in the North Pacific. Uh, the wave number one Fourier mode is also significantly larger um, as well when you have an anomalous low in the North Pacific as compared to an anomalous ridge in the North Pacific. In other words, uh, the North Pacific is a very effective way of modulating wave number one in the troposphere and stratosphere as well. So then uh, I want to go back to um, M the MJO and ENSO and also the, and how the MJO and ENSO uh, modulate the, the stratospheric uh, polar vortex. Just revisit that connection. Uh, so the MJO, um, again, to remind you, the MJO was that phenomena in the tropical, tropical troposphere where we have convection propagating from the Indian Ocean to the eastern to the to the Central Pacific. Uh, so if you look at um, so just before I talk about the MGO, uh, you know, so if you look at um, this is what I'm showing here are height anomalies in the mid-trope here, 500, 500 pascals at five kilometers above the surface. Um, these are height anomalies um, here in, the, in the North Pacific, in this region here, here in North America, here's Asia. Uh, so three day, three days before the eight days after MGO phase seven. Uh, there was a, a low anomaly in the North Pacific. And then a month after uh, MGO phase three, we also have a, a, a low anomaly in the North Pacific. And, and, this, and both of these low anomalies, um, both of these phases, a month after MGO phase three, and also immediately after MGO phase seven, that's when we saw enhanced frequency of stratospheric sun warmings. Uh, uh, we saw weakening of the vortex for both of these. And if you compare these patterns, uh, the, the, the low in the North Pacific for both of these, and this is the pattern uh, 20 days before sudden warmings, uh, regardless of MGO, regardless of ENSO, you, you see that there's some similarity. Uh, both of the, and all, all three of these patterns feature a low in the North Pacific. Um, and this low in the North Pacific can constructively interfere with the stationary waves, the climatological stationary waves, and lead to more wave propagation uh, from the troposphere into the stratosphere. Uh, so then this is the, this figure here summarizes the impact of the Magellanic oscillation on the on the, on the um, in the troposphere, the North Pacific and the troposphere, and then on the polar cap in the stratosphere. So this, the, the left hand side is showing the height in the North Pacific in the sun warming precursor region. So in the North Pacific, basically, uh, what is a height anomaly uh, for all MGO phases? Is, again, this is convection in, in the Indian Ocean, convection <coughs> in the Central Pacific. So as for MGO phase seven and eight. Uh, when the convection is in the Central Pacific, we have immediately uh, associated with that, um, we have a low in the North Pacific. MGO phases four, five, and six, about 15 days after MGO phases four, five, and six, we have a, a deep and low in the North Pacific. And then about a month after MGO phases two and three, we have a low in the North Pacific. And so it's because we have this low in the North Pacific, about a week later, uh, after this low in the, in the North Pacific develops, uh, roughly a week later, the pole is anomalously warm. The vortex is weakened, the pole is warmed, uh, and which then leads to this influence, uh, downward influence on the troposphere a couple of weeks after that. And whenever you see these markers, that means that there's a significant response. So this is the effect of MGO on the vortex, on the North Pacific and then the vortex. And then I want to go back to the effect of El Nino. So associated with El Nino, um, Associated with the, deep the changes in deep convection in, this, in the Central Pacific, we have uh, changes in uh, we have changes in the in the geopotential heights um, in the in the uh, further forward as well over the North Pacific region. So again, this is in the in the up in the upper troposphere, about uh, about five kilometers above the surface. We have uh, associated with El Nino during El Nino winters, we have an anomalous trough in the North Pacific, uh, just generated directly by El Nino. 
And then in the right hand side here shows the wave number one, it's only wave number one, uh, Fourier decomposition of the full field. And then the bottom is the is a cometology. I showed it this a couple times already. This is this wave number one, um, the, the wave number one component of the, of the cometology of the, of the stationary wave field. And if you compare these two panels, you see that they're in phase with each other. In other words, the wave number one pattern associated with El Nino is constructively interferes with and reinforces the cometological stationary waves. And because of that, uh, we, we end up having uh, more wave propagation associated with El Nino into the stratosphere. And therefore, a weakened vortex, um, which starts in the mid-stratosphere and then propagates downwards in time. And just one, one final diagnostic um, that isolates the effect of changes in the, in the North Pacific um, on, on the stratospheric polar vortex. So what I'm showing here is a function, as a function of height from the troposphere into the stratosphere, uh, the polar region geopensional anomaly. What this means is that positive values mean a weaker vortex. So, and what I'm showing here is three different composites, uh, three, three different curves. This, I'll first talk about this curve here, uh, this dash stack curve. Um, so what I, what I do for this curve is I take months that have a, a deepened low in the North Pacific, um, and then months with, the, with a, an almost ridge in the North Pacific, uh, in which there is no ENSO anomaly. So months in which there's a deep and low in the North Pacific, months in which there's a ridge in the North Pacific, without any, but ENSO is neutral. And, I, and then I look at the difference between them, between these two composites uh, of, the, of, the, of the vortex state, um, the vortex in the, in the stratosphere and also um, the, the, in the twip sphere as well. And what you see is that there's a, there's a, there's a very strong and it turned out to be a significant response um, to the, the difference in months in which there's a low in the North Pacific versus a ridge in the North Pacific. Um, this black line here is a, a similar construction. I'm taking months that are El Nino and La Nina, uh, but there's no response in the North Pacific. So in other words, even though La Nina typically, El Nino typically leads to a, a El Nino leads to a, a trough in the North Pacific, and La Nina leads to a ridge in the North Pacific, it doesn't always ha occur. In other words, some, some months, uh, the typical El Nino metallic connection will be weaker than what maybe what than what you might expect. Um, so we can take months that are that were El Nino, but there was no response in the North Pacific, and months that were La Nina with no response in the North Pacific, and, and then look at the difference between those two composites. And there's basically no difference. So there's a very weak difference between these two composites. In other words, only when El Nino modulates the North Pacific do we see a large response um, in the polar vortex, and, and then and we then see this downward propagation. Uh, from the polar from the polar region from the, in the stratosphere uh, down to the lower stratosphere and then down to the surface, which can lead to impacts on weather that we experience. So I think I'll skip this and then skip straight to the conclusions. Um, so more generally, the, the stratosphere, the shape of the polar stratosphere, uh, can be used uh, to to enhance our projections our, and our predictions uh, predict predictions. Uh, variability uh, in, in the troposphere surface climate um, s several months in advance. In the case of El Nino, several, several, several months in advance. In the case of the MJO, Mandrillian Oscillation, um, a month in advance. Both MJO and, and El Nino modulate the vortex by deepening the North Pacific low, uh, which in turn leads to enhanced wave propagation uh, um, via constructive interference with the climatological stationary waves. Um, after this vortex is modulated, the anomalies propagate downwards. And we have a strong impacts on surface climate uh, throughout the extratropical northern hemisphere, including Israel and other regions as well. All right, th thank you. I see that there's no questions. So thank you very much for your talk.